Well, welcome to the Tipping Point Show. Uh, I'm Mark Hitchcock, and on uh, today's episode, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, a future event called the Judgment Seat of Christ. And in our subscriber portion, I'm answering some questions as well as responding to some news about uh, climate change, um, about uh, the, the gas crisis over in Europe, and, and a little bit of information at the end that I think you'll find fascinating um, about robots. Uh, but I want to begin just by talking about uh, the judgment seat of Christ. It's uh, an event that's going to take place in the future. That's a very important event for, for you and for me to understand, because if we're a believer in Jesus Christ, every one of us will stand someday before the Lord at this event called the judgment seat of Christ. Let me just begin by reading what is uh, probably the, the key verse uh, in, in the New Testament about this uh, future event. It's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and uh, verse 10 simply says this, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The word judgment seat, there's literally the Greek word bema. It's the bema seat. We must occur, uh, appear before the judgment seat or the bema seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Uh, years ago, I read a, a great story. It's a story about uh, Annie Oakley. Um, Annie Oakley, if you've never heard of her, she was known as Little Sure Shot. Uh, she was kind of the first uh, uh, female superstar in, in uh, showbiz. Um, she was part of uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. And uh, in the, the late 1890s, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show was popular all over the United States, but they took it over to Europe. It was so well known. And so they took it over to Europe and they were in uh, Berlin in 1899. Now, one of the, Annie Oakley would do a lot of things during her, uh, her part of the show. She could, they would throw a coin in the air and she could shoot it out of the air. She'd put a rifle on her shoulder and shoot an apple, you know, from a distance away. Uh, they could throw up a playing card um, some distance away and she'd draw her pistol quickly and shoot it in half before it hit the ground. So she was the, the best shot with a rifle or a pistol um, of her day. And during her, her part of her act, one of the things she would always do is she would call for a, a volunteer from the audience. And she'd call for this volunteer to come forward and put a, a long cigar in their mouth with some ashes that were burned at the end. And she'd take a 45 pistol and shoot the ashes off the end of the cigar. Now, as you can imagine, sometimes no one would volunteer. So her husband, Frank Butler, was always in the audience. And of course, people didn't know who he was, but he would always volunteer and, and come forward for this part of the show. Now, I always like to, to think in my mind that she probably was really nice to Frank. The Frank Butler was probably really nice to Annie Oakley uh, because, uh, you know, she, his life was in her hands as she'd shoot these ashes off the end of the cigar. But in, but in 1899, when, when Buffalo Bill's Wild West show was in, was in Berlin, when it came to the part of the show where Annie Oakley asked for this volunteer, uh, the, the Kaiser Wilhelm, the, the Kaiser of, of Germany, stepped forward to volunteer. So Annie Oakley lights this cigar, this long cigar. There's some burned ashes on the end. And she takes her 45 pistol and shoots the ashes right off the end of, of his cigar. And uh, as you know from history, um, 15 years later in 1914, Kaiser Wilhelm plunged the world into the carnage of World War I. And the story goes that Annie Oakley sent a letter to Kaiser Wilhelm. And in that letter, one of the things she asked for, is she asked him if she could have another shot. Now, we don't know if Kaiser Wilhelm ever responded to her or not, but I like that story because like Annie Oakley, when it comes to life here on earth, you and I only get one shot. Now, there aren't any dress rehearsals. There, there's no do-overs. There's no mulligans. Uh, life here on earth is brief, but it counts for all eternity. And you and I only get one chance. We only get one shot at life. There, there's no replay. Uh, there's no rewind. So you and I need to take dead aim with the one shot that we have at life. And I like what Randy Alcorn says. He's a well-known Christian author. He says, at death, we put the signature on our life's portrait. The paint dries, the portrait's done, ready or not. And when that happens, according to the Bible, each one of us will stand before the Lord to give an account for our lives, to give an account of what we did with that one shot at life that we had. Because remember, Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed a man once to die, and after that comes the judgment. And that'll be the time then when you and I each have to stand uh, before the Lord. 
And then we're going to stand before the Lord at this future event called the judgment seat of Christ. That's going to be kind of like our final examination. And it's going to determine what our life will be like uh, for all of eternity. So what I want to do in just a few moments we have here is talk about the participants, who's going to be at the judgment seat, uh, the place, where is it going to occur, the period, uh, when will it happen, the purpose, why will this judgment seat occur, and then the preparation. Just spend a few moments on that of how do we get ready uh, for this future event. So the first point is, who are the participants at the judgment seat of Christ? Well, in, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, that verse I read a few moments ago, the Apostle Paul says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That word we there includes Paul, but I think it includes all believers in Jesus Christ as well. So the judgment seat of Christ is a time of judgment for uh, believers. Now, it's really important to distinguish between the judgment seat of Christ and another event in the Bible called the Great White Throne Judgment. Uh, the Great White Throne Judgment is in Revelation chapter 20, all the way at the end of the millennium, the millennial reign of Christ. And that's where all the lost will be resurrected and brought before God there to be judged for their sins. So every person who's listening to me right now will we'll all appear at one of those two judgments. We'll either appear at the judgment seat of Christ as a believer or will appear at the great white throne as an unbeliever in the most sobering scene really in the Bible when those who are there are going to be ultimately cast in to the lake of fire. So you want to make sure you're a believer in Christ and you'll be at this judgment seat. But notice it says in, in, in that passage in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear. Notice it's, it's a must. It's not optional. This is an obligation and a necessity. So again, every one of us will appear at one of these two future judgments. And he says, we must all appear. The all there, I think, is every church age believer, every believer alive during this church age. Nobody's exempt. Now, it's interesting in that verse, Paul switches from the we to each one and to his and to he. So we must all appear, but then he switches and uses the singular there. So it's going to be an individual judgment. Uh, Romans 14.10 says, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. Each one of us will give an account of himself to God. I like what one old preacher I heard years ago say. He said, every one of us will have to sing solo before God. So every believer is going to have to appear, every church age believer, before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the next thing we see here is the where. Where is this going to take place? Well, it says there in 2 Corinthians 5.10 that it's going to be at the judgment seat or the Bema seat of Christ. Um, a Bema back in uh, the first century just meant a step or a raised platform that required steps to ascend. It's a, kind of like a, a tribunal. And every major Greek and Roman city had a Bema seat or a judgment seat in the marketplace. If any of you have ever had the privilege to visit the city of Philippi or the city of Corinth in the what was called the Agora, that's the Greek word or the, the Roman word was a forum in the marketplace, they would have this raised area known as the Bema or the judgment seat. And there's one in Corinth. So Paul's writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians and right there in their marketplace, they had a judgment seat or a Bema there. Now this is called in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, the judgment seat of Christ. So Jesus is the judge at the judgment seat. John 5, 22 says, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he's given all judgment to the Son. So every believer, every church-age believer, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be judged there before Jesus um, in, in heaven uh, by our Lord. Now, the third question concerning the judgment seat is, when is it going to take place? When's this judgment seat going to happen? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, it says there, when the Lord comes, he's going to bring to light the things hidden in darkness, and then each man's uh, motives will be exposed and brought into the light. So it's when the Lord comes. When the Lord comes, he's going to expose the things hidden in the darkness and bring to light uh, the motives of men's hearts. So the, the judgment seat of Christ is going to happen in heaven, I believe, right after the rapture. So right after church age believers are caught up to be with the Lord, those who've died, they'll be resurrected. Those of us who are alive are going to be caught up immediately to be with the Lord. So the first order of business when we get to heaven will be uh, this event called uh, the judgment seat of Christ. All the way in Revelation chapter 22, remember Jesus said, behold, I'm coming quickly. 
my reward is with me to give to every man according to what he's done. So one of these days, the rapture is going to take place and we're going to be caught up to heaven. And when we're caught up to heaven, the first thing that will take place is this event uh, known as, as the judgment seat of Christ. Now that brings us to the fourth key question here, and that is why. Why is there going to be uh, a judgment seat? Well, before we look at, at what the purpose is, let me let me make sure that we know what it's not. The purpose of the judgment seat is not to determine if we get into heaven or not. Um, it's faith in Jesus Christ that determines where we spend eternity. And that's determined here on earth. So the issue at the judgment seat of Christ is not where you will spend eternity, but how you will spend eternity. Faith in Jesus Christ determines where we spend eternity. Our works for Jesus Christ after we become a believer determine how we will spend eternity. So salvation is by belief. Rewards are based on our behavior after our belief. We, we never want to get those two mixed up. Salvation is based totally upon Christ's work for us. Our rewards are based on our works for Christ after we become a believer. So salvation is by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Um, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So you and I are saved completely by the mercy of Jesus Christ, not by our merit. We're saved not by our doing, but by his dying. So the purpose of the judgment seat is not to determine if we get into heaven or not. That was determined when we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. So you say, well, okay, then what is the purpose of the judgment seat of Christ? Well, it says there in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 that each one might receive a reward or a recompense. So the purpose of this Bema seat or this judgment seat of Christ is for every believer's life to be reviewed by Jesus and rewarded for our service on our ministry as a believer to be evaluated, to receive a reward. Now, you'll notice it when I read 2 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 5, verse, verse, verse 10, that it said uh, there in that verse, it says that each one will be rewarded according to the things he's done in the body, whether good or bad. And you say, well, what is the good or the bad? Well, the bad here, there, there's a Greek word that means bad in the sense of evil, and that's not the word used here. The word used here is the Greek word phallos, which means bad in the sense of worthless. So at the judgment seat, when Jesus evaluates what we've done, I don't believe that he's going to bring up our sins. Uh, the, the price for our sins has been paid. Um, our sins have been covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and God says he's going to remember them no more. They, they've been cast into the depths of the sea. They're cast as far as the east is from the west. So the bad here, I think, are the things that are unrewardable. Uh, there are things that maybe we thought were good things that we did, but something maybe that we did uh, with a bad motive. But again, it's not our sins. I don't think our sins will be brought up at, at the judgment seat of Christ. So I think what I would call these is, um, if, if they're not sin, what would we call them? I call them bad good works. And what makes them bad or worthless, I think, is they're things maybe done with a wrong motive. Good things in themselves, but done for self-glory. So not worthy of reward. In other words, they're non-rewardable. And this raises an important point for us. God not only knows what we do, but why we do it. Uh, God knows our motive. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, each one we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That word appear means to be made manifest, to be disclosed. So God's going to disclose uh, what we really are. And then um, over in, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 4 and verse 5, it's a verse uh, I quoted a few minutes ago, but it says there, uh, when the Lord comes, he'll bring to light the things hidden in darkness, and he'll expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive um, his praise uh, from God. Uh, there's an old story I like to tell about a group of children who were lined up in a cafeteria at a Catholic elementary school. And um, at the head of the table was a large pile of apples. And a nun had written a note there posted on the apple tray, and it said, take only one and remember God is watching. Well, they moved further along down the lunch line, and at the end of the, the table, there was a large pile of chocolate chip cookies. And one of the children had written a note there that said, take all you want, God's watching the apples. Well, the truth is God's watching the apples and the cookies. God knows everything. 
Uh, God's omniscient eye not only sees to us, but sees through us. So God knows our motives. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, I probably won't get anything then. Um, you know, I'm probably not going to get anything from the Lord when, when these rewards are given out. Now, I feel that way myself often. Um, you know, will, will every believer get a reward? Well, look at my best. I can't think of anything that I do without some of Mark Hitchcock in it. I can't think of anything I do with 100% pure motives. Maybe just you know something I do quickly enough where I, I don't have time to, to really think about it. And so any reward I get, any reward you get, will ultimately be purely due to the grace of God. But, but I love the verse in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, that says there that each man's praise will come to him from God. Notice it's singular there. Each person's praise will come to him from God. I used to hold the idea that some people at the judgment seat of Christ would get no reward. But based on this verse now, I believe that each believer, God will find something in our life to reward. Each one's praise will come from God. And stop and think about that for a moment. Uh, the Lord of the ages, uh, the creator of the universe, the shepherd of the stars will praise you and me and will reward us. And that's a, a staggering thing to think about. We'll get his praise and his, his commendation. You say, well, well, what other kind of rewards will we get? Well, this, this is a, that'd be a, could be a whole nother uh, teaching we could do for, for quite some time. But there's also crowns we're going to be given. You, you've read in the book of Revelation about uh, the 24 elders casting their crowns at Jesus' feet. There are going to be crowns that are going to be given um, in heaven for faithful service. Uh, there's the incorruptible crown, the, the crown of life, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, the crown of rejoicing. Again, uh, some other time I may do a teaching on those, just those crowns uh, that we'll, uh, we'll receive. But um, there's, there's going to be privileges that God gives to us. And again, when we give the crowns and cast them at Jesus' feet, I don't think that means that we won't still receive the benefit of those rewards. I just think it means we'll be giving God the glory and giving Christ the glory uh, for, for what we've received. But I think there's a, another reward we'll receive, which is a greater opportunity and capacity to glorify the Lord. Um, Daniel chapter 12, verse three says, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So kind of like different wattage of light bulbs. You know, if you have a, a chandelier, you might have a, a 25 watt bulb and a 50 watt bulb and a 75 watt bulb. I think as believers, based on how we've lived our life here, God will give us greater capacities to reflect and to uh, show uh, the, his glory and his greatness. Um, Warren Wiersbe has a, a great statement I read years ago. He said, when we receive our rewards someday in heaven, he says, everyone's cup will be full, but some people's cups will be larger than others. And I think that's a great way to picture this. No one's going to have a, a half full cup in heaven. We'll all have a full cup, but some of us will have larger cups. We'll have a, a larger, greater opportunity and capacity uh, to glorify the Lord. And then one final reward that I think we'll, the Lord will give out is uh, positions uh, of ruling with him, greater places of responsibility. You know, in Luke chapter 19, Jesus said, some will rule over five cities, some will rule over 10 cities. Um, I like to say this is training time for reigning time. So how you and I spend eternity will be vastly different based on how we've lived our life now. The person you are today is going to determine uh, the rewards that you're going to receive tomorrow and the life you're going to live uh, for all of eternity. Let me just uh, mention a few things here as we close. And again, I might come back and deal with, with some of these points in more detail in the future. But one question you might ask is, well, how do we get ready for the judgment See, What are some of the things we can do? Well, I've written a book uh, that some of you may want to purchase. It's called uh, Heavenly Rewards. And I have a, a whole long chapter on the various things that you and I can do to gain reward. There are about 15 specific things that are listed in Scripture. But let me just uh, go through a few of these quickly. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do every day. And these aren't necessarily sensational, spectacular things. These are things that you and I can do every day. The first one is how we employ our God-given talents, abilities, and opportunities. Um, you read Matthew chapter 25, the, the parable of the talents. Matthew 19, the parable of the minas. The point there is the master has left us with his resources to invest for us to maximize those. And when he returns, he wants a return on his investment, a maximum return. 
So whatever abilities and gifts and opportunities you have, you need to invest those and use those the best you can to give God a return on his investment. I like what uh, Hudson Taylor said years ago, the great missionary to China. He said, a little thing is a little thing, but faithfulness in a little thing is a big thing. Isn't that great quote? A little thing's a little thing, but faithfulness in a little thing is a big thing. You be faithful in, in the, the opportunities God gives you and, and God will reward you. Um, a second thing God's gonna reward is how we run the race God's given to us. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize. Run in a way that you can win. Look, God's given each of us a race to run. I don't have to run your race. You don't have to run my race. We need to stay in our lane and run the race uh, that God has given us. Um, another uh, thing that God's gonna reward is how effectively we control our fleshly appetites. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter nine, Paul says, you know, I run the race and I run to win. And he says, I buffet my body. The word buffet there, now it's not buffet. I don't buffet my body. We do that too much probably, but that's I buffet my body, the old King James says, which means to literally to beat it black and blue. We discipline our body. Paul says, last having preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. And he doesn't mean disqualified in the sense of losing his salvation. He means disqualified from receiving a reward. So how well we harness our fleshly desires and appetites in this life is going to bring reward from God. Another one's how humble we are. Um, the Bible says that you know, he who's the least in this life will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So God rewards humility. And in, uh, in Colossians chapter three, I won't take time to read this, but Colossians three, verses 22 to 24, talks about how faithful we are in our vocation or our work. So wherever you work, wherever you're employed, maybe you own your own business, but the work that you do, the secular work that you do, your vocation, God's gonna reward you uh, someday based on that. Well, look, the Bible's clear. There's a final examination that's coming for each one of us. And uh, those are a few of the test questions. There are many more. Uh, but you and I need to begin and start cramming for the test so you can get an A uh, on your final exam. You may say, well, what if I'd blown it? Or what if I've kind of wasted this one shot at life God's given to me? Look, God is gracious in giving rewards. I would just encourage you, begin today to serve him. It's never too late. Give him what's left of your life and God will reward you uh, beyond your wildest dreams. Don't give up. Uh, live today in light of that day. So that someday when we stand before the Lord, we can hear those words, oh, well done, oh, thou good and, and faithful servant. Well, those watching on uh, YouTube, be sure to subscribe to this channel to be notified of all of our latest uh, content. Uh, we're now gonna transition to our endtimes.com subscriber portion of the show where I'll be answering some of your questions and discussing uh, a couple of, uh, or about three different uh, uh, current event issues. And if you aren't an endtimes.com subscriber, uh, you can join today for $7 a month or $77 a year. Uh, just go to endtimes.com. And I think if you do that, you'll really benefit from it. Thanks for watching our weekly Tipping Point show. If you enjoyed this show, leave a comment below and like and subscribe to our channel.